Good morning, I am Dennis Schmidt, the pastor of Dubuque Community Church, and the title of today's message is Love Must Be Tough. Now, you might be a little shocked by that title. You might have been expecting me to say love must be kind or love must be patient, but love also must be, and by the way, you should be patient and kind, but it also need, you need to be tough. You need to be strong and resilient and firm you know, when I was a younger man and hanging around with scrappier people, when I said somebody was tough, that meant they could take a punch and keep on going. That wouldn't stop them. Well, uh, that's really true about, uh, as we talk about love today, too. Love, boy, it just takes a lot of, a lot of uh, courage. It takes a lot of strength. And uh, that's actually the kind of love that we're going to, as we talk about what, not what the world calls love, but what God calls love, and uh, we're going to see that today. And uh, I love the picture that, that's up there uh, because right there, as you see that, it's the Bible. It's the Word of God, but it's shaped in the shape of a heart. And uh, because it's really only once you re read the Bible that you begin to really understand how much God loves us. That's where we find out. And when God speaks of love, it's a very important noun and maybe you've heard this before in the Greek. It's agape love. It's the highest form of love. By the way, I just wanted to do this for my grandkids too. Sometimes when we're leaving our grandkids, we'll go like this when we're walking away. And you know, that's that sign of the heart, like that's on that, that Bible there. But it's telling us, telling the people, I love you. And the word of God is the clearest area where you're gonna to get told how much God really loves you. But God, when he speaks of, of agape, uh, he's speaking about a type of love. And by the way, we shouldn't just be talking about love in Valentine's Day, but every day of the year. But it should be a, a foundational motivation for everything we do. And agape love is giving others, uh, seeking the welfare of others, even if it costs you greatly at great personal cost to yourself and just the other day i was working on this message and my grandkids were watching frozen and actually the uh, the olaf the the snowman uh, was talking about true love is love where the other where the person puts another person in front of their own desires and needs so that boy that was right on in the movie frozen well, the world uses the, wor the word love excessively. Many of us use it a lot and we misuse it. And I really want to say today that I believe that love, the word love is the most misused and abused word in the English language. And I often even make the mistake myself. Sometimes, you know, when I, I use my tractor and plow out my snow and I'm so grateful that I didn't have to do that all with a snowblower and, uh, you know, and I will say, I love my John Deere tractor. Well, whenever my sister-in-law is around or anybody else, uh, many other people correct me as well and say, you can't love something that cannot love you back. And I have to agree with that. And uh, so I misuse it too. And this, uh, this, this lost world, and especially the media, the major media today is really misusing this word. And the word, when they're talking about love, it doesn't have the gritty, uh, powerful uh, uh, love that, that the word of God calls us for. And, uh, and again, in the Greek, there's a, there's a word uh, from in the New Testament where it's talking about the kind of love that this world has. It's not true love, it's eros, where we get the word erotic. Uh, people, you know, they fall in love for a week or a month or a year, and then as soon as things aren't going real well anymore, uh, they, 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 they quit saying, I don't, love, I don't love you anymore. Well, it's a selfish love. And by the way, that's an oxymoron, selfish love. Selfishness is the opposite of love, and you're gonna see that today that to really love like God loves, we have to overcome our own selfishness. And uh, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah had a lot of erotic love. Uh, there was a lot of uh, all kinds of feelings, but with no commitment. And again, commitment is a very important part of real agape, tough love. And there is another kind of phileo, uh, love, and that's called phileo love. And I wanna just hit that one yet today too. 
That is, if you treat me nice, I will be nice to you. Well, that's, you know, uh, where we get the word phileo or is for Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. But it, even that, as much as that's better than just erotic love, but it is, the, it, it's, uh, it's not real tough Christian love that God wants us to have. Many marriages start out with phileo love. You know, you're doing something for me, I'm doing something for you, and this is all great until at some point one person says, uh, there's nothing in this for me anymore, and therefore they say, I no longer love this other person. Well, love will, true agape love will love the other person even when they don't love you. So that's really important that we understand this agape love because this is the kind of love that God has for us. Well, Jesus told how important love was uh, when uh, he was asked by some teachers of the laws of all the commandments, what are the greatest? And Jesus replied the, in Mark 12, 29 out of the screen, he said, the most important one Jesus answered is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that's very important. We know that there's only one God. And then he goes on and he says this, And we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandments greater than these. Well, when God is saying you need to love the Lord your God, he's using the word agape. That means to put God ahead of yourself and to love Almighty God. And you know, God deserves that. He truly deserves it because he created all things and gave us all things. And it says to do it with all your soul, your mind, your strength, every ounce and iota of your being to love, your, love the Lord your God. And then he also says, if that wasn't hard enough, he says, love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Everyone around you, including your spouse or your brothers or your sisters or your neighbors, uh, cousins. Uh, everybody you come in contact with, you are to love them and want to desire to put what's best for them instead of for yourself. Uh, the, he says, this is the most important directives of all the, all the Word of God. It's all together in those simple statements. But here's what I want to challenge us all with today. And there's a big problem with God saying, that's all you have to do. And then if you do that, you can, you can be with God in heaven for all eternity. And here's the problem. We can't do that. I can't do that. You can't do that. Just stop and think for a minute. If you are, have ever loved everybody around you uh, more than yourself, you've put God ahead of yourself, you've never, never put your, yourself ahead of anyone else, uh, we can't do that. And just that alone, if, that, if we had to do that to get to heaven, none of us would make us. And thank God, make it. Because thank God Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. Or, or not, uh, with that is our perfect uh, direction, we would be in a lot of trouble. So should we just throw our hands up in the air and say, this is too hard, I can't do it, I might as well not do anything. Well, one of the things that the Bible does is that it shows us God's perfect will. And then after it shows us God's perfect will, we are to shoot toward God's perfect will. And even though we never will totally achieve that here on this earth, we will do much better than if we just set our sights a lot lower and just put, uh, decided what we were going to do for shoot, what we were going to shoot for, and we would settle for much less, and we'd never be stretched out to really grow in our love the way God has called us to. And as we continue to look at this elusive but highly important foundation of Christianity, love really is the foundation of Christianity, we need to remind ourselves again the difference between two different things. And that's called salvation and sanctification. And we're not going to go too deep in that. But the day you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are what's called saved. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're going to spend eternity with God in heaven. Praise God. But then there's a second part that's a process that kicks in. And it's an ongoing process. 
And for the rest of your life here on the, this earth, the Holy Spirit will be directing you and guiding you and leading you. And as you fill your life with the Word of God, He will begin to change you and to make you this person. And actually, what He's going to do is to change you into being more like Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to see now, as we're setting our sights on really learning and growing and, and getting this agape love in our lives instead of the selfish love that many of us had and really all of us have, even at, at best it's a selfish love. And here's what God uh, wants us to know. And here's where it all starts for you to get your agape love in your life. And here's the first one. And it tells us in 1 John 4, 19 through 21, we love because he first loved us. God is the originator of all true agape love, tough love, and it only begins to be created in us when we begin to understand how much God loves me. You can't agape love anyone else until you know that God agape, tough, unconditional love it was given to you, and then you begin to see what he has. You can't give away something you don't have, but once you start to see you have it, you can start to give it away. And then he challenges a little more in verse 20 here. It says, if anyone says, I love God, you know, we say, I love God, which is easy because he loves us, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. <laughs> That's pretty strong. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. God's very clear that you cannot love God and say you love God, but you hate your brother. So I used to argue with God about this a lot. And guess who, who won the argument? It wasn't me. And so then he continues on. On another verse to just kind of drive this point home and he says this and he has given us this command and it's not a suggestion whoever loves God must also love his brother now there's that tough challenge there if you say I love God but you got somebody that you don't love then you 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 got a problem and uh, God will challenge you on that and so as we begin to understand how we do not really have agape love, hopefully this is going to move us toward the mark of beginning to, uh, to uh, move toward giving that agape love to those around us. And that's why we're going to move to our next slide here where we go to Colossians where it's going to show us how much God loves us and then it's going to challenge us to love others around us that same way. So in Colossians 3, 1 through 4 here, it says this, and this is a key. Since then, you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Well, when Jesus came out of that tomb and was raised to supernatural life, you too, when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you also will be raised to a new supernatural life, praise God. When he was raised, you were raised with him. And now, because you have been raised, it says you should set your th hearts on things above. You know, we must focus our hearts on what God had his focus on. Instead of focusing on the perishing things of this world, and, and, and as you do, as you set yourself free from being in love with the things of this world, you will begin to grow in agape love. When you're in love with the things of this world, that's getting in the way of you growing in agape love. If you truly want to love the way God wants to love, then you have to stop loving this world. And I'm telling you, I'm preaching to myself right now as I'm preaching to you. And then the second part of that uh, screen, it says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Well, this is a choice you must make. 
What am I going to set my mind on? What am I going to think about? Am I going to be just thinking about taking care of me, myself, and I? If I do, that is an enemy of true agape, tough love that God uh, wants us to all have. And that's where we're supposed to be going. And hopefully we're all heading that way. Now we're going to see something even more shocking. And this word, we don't even like this one. Verse 3, it says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ. Well, for you died, this is the part we don't like to, like to we'd like to skip this. We'd like to have our cake and eat it too. Uh, we want that new life in Jesus. We want that new resurrected power. We want the peace of God. But we also want to hang on to our old life. And it says, you must let that go. You must let yourself die. And you must, so that you can be hidden in Christ. You hide, die to yourself. So the world and God and everyone else begins to not see you so much. They don't see the old man so much anymore. But they begin to see Jesus Christ living in you. And you know what? This is not easy. If I told you this was easy, I'd be a liar. It's, it's hard. And that gets right back to where I said, remember that I call this message tough love, uh, a love that's called to be strong and resilient and gritty and firm and to do things that are not easy. Uh, that's where it all comes in when we start deciding to turn away from our old life and turn to the new life. And it says then in verse 4, And then if you do that, when Christ, who is your life, he's now your life, it's not your old life, he appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Well, uh, your life is no longer yours, and it's been purchased by him when he died on that cross. And when he appears, when he comes back for his bride, then we will be with him, and we will enjoy the blessings that come by knowing the Lord. Well, Colossians continues in verse 5, and why? Here we go again, for, and by repeated for emphasis again for, because of the importance of it. Now it is saying, put to death. That's an active verb where this is something you need to do. Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, your old selfish ways of thinking, and then it names them. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. All these corrupt fruits of our old selfish nature are, will destroy your ability to produce real agape love. And, and it, the last part of it even said greed, which is idolatry. And you know what? None of us like to realize we're greedy. But God forgive us, we all are greedy. We want so much. We live in America, and I really believe greed is the sin of America. Uh, we want, and when we're so focused on the things of this world, we can never truly uh, be moved to true agape love. And then this last part of the verse is, and here's a good reason to get rid of it, other than you want to have a copy of love, is because of these, the wrath of God is coming. God is very clear that he will judge this corrupt fruit. And <clears throat> if we don't want to reap the reward that comes with that, we need to get away from it. And then it continues, and I love the word of God. It doesn't sugarcoat us. It tells us just the way things are. Verse 7, <clears throat> it doesn't say, well, there's some people that used to walk in these ways. It said, you <laughs> used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. God's telling us before the sanctification process came, we were all selfish. We were all self-centered. And then it says, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language from yourself. Again, it's talking about dying. It's talking about getting rid of these things. That's why you got to be tough. You got to get rid of this anger, or anger and rage. And by the way, all of these kind of Selfish emotions come from the fact that we think we're not being treated right or somebody's getting something more than we're getting. And so it's all selfishness. It really is selfishness. And even in the last part of it says, in all filthy language from your lips. And you know, when we often talk, think about filthy language, we think about somebody saying you know, kind of sexual innuendos and things like that. 
But you know, filthy language just means any kind of corrupt language coming out of your mouth. And you know what? You can stop and think if you're anything like me. When I start getting angry, I'll start to say things maybe that I wouldn't say any time other. It begins to be corrupt language. And we need to get away from all that anger and bitterness and rage. That is absolutely antithetical to the opposite of agape love. And I want to give you a helpful hint because when early on in my walk with God, I didn't always walk with God, I can tell you. And uh, I had a lot of anger and bitterness and resentment and all this. And a friend of mine told me, the next time you start getting angry, don't just sit there and meditate on your anger. Don't sit there and go over that and over that. He said, change the station. And literally back then, it was that long ago, it was a radio station, but you can also apply it to a TV station. And that is, in your mind, you're sitting there, you're all worked up about all these things. You choose to change to a different station, which is, and by the way, a good praise station, a station that's given glory and honor to God, and you just begin to do that rather than focusing on what you're angry about. So uh, that's a great tool. If you learn to do that, it took a little work on my part, but it really began to help me. Then it continues to go on to kind of expose us for who we really are without Christ in our life and all these enemies of true agape love. It says, do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. Uh, God is the God of truth and the devil is the father of all lies. And we all like to stack the deck and, you know, if it's something good, we want to take credit for it. Or if it's something bad, we want to give some point our finger to somebody else. They even you have a whole name for it in our modern culture. They call it spin. Uh, kind of tell the story to kind of make yourself look well. Well, that's where a lot of lying comes from. And if we really want to be, uh, have agape love, we must tell the truth. And uh, so it goes on. It says, do not lie to each other. And since you have taken off your old self, with its practices. And I want to just talk about that for just a minute here today. Uh, God is using the image of you have like old dirty clothes on, like an old dirty cloak and clothes and putting on a new clean cloak. Well, that happened when you accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And it's almost like you were a pop, pauper, a, a poor person, a beggar, and you were out walking around in rags and everything and dirty and everything. Nobody would be upset with you for doing that. But now it says, now you're not a, a, a beggar anymore. You're a prince. You're the son of God. You're one of God's children. And if you're still walking around with them old, dirty clothes on, uh, then people say, that guy's a prince, but he's still wearing them old, dirty, ragged clothes. Why doesn't he put on his new clothes? And that's what God is saying here. When you have all this anger and bitterness and resentment, you're still walking around like that old beggar. And God wants you to be a prince. Well, then it says, and having put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. So again, it put, talks about putting it on and it talks about us uh, uh, doing some of the work. And how do we renew, uh, renewed in knowledge in the image of the creator? How does that happen? As we read God's holy word, we begin to understand more and more who God is and we begin to be more like Jesus Christ. That's the end point for all of us. And then it says here, here it, in this slide, it says here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. It's basically what it's saying. We all start out the same. We're all a long way from God. We're all selfish. But in the end, we are to be like Christ. Well, then as we continue on, it says, therefore, as God's chosen people. God chose you. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and, and holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. 
And, uh, you know, God chose us and he poured his extreme agape love on us. He showed us kindness and gentleness and patience. We received it from him. And again, uh, it, get rid of that old dirty clothes. In verse 13, really important, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Well, forgiveness is such a key important. You cannot walk around with unforgiveness in your heart, anger and bitterness and resentment, all of these things we talked about. You cannot have that and also uh, be directed in agape love, giving out love to others. And uh, we just really need to understand that we need to uh, bear with each other and forgive each other as the Lord forgave you. How did he forgive you? Absolutely, completely everything. He has forgiven us all. And then it says, and all, and all these virtues put on love, which bond, binds them all together in a perfect unity. Just a nice little per, pretty ribbon binding it all together. Let the peace of God, Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to be peace to peace and be thankful. Well, Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, and it's important that we reflect his, his personality. And you know, here's something, and I, I, this is all, like I said, I'm preaching to myself, and being thankful, being glad for what you do have, not angry for what you do not have. Very important part. You can't be angry or feel like you're being misused and then turn around and give somebody true, agape, beautiful love. It just won't happen. So we just need to be aware of that. We need to be thankful and we need to be thanking God for all that he has done for us. And that's the next verse tells us this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How will you get thankful? Be understanding what God did for you. To, as to you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart to God. Well, true agape love is a thankful love. It's a, it's a, and music will remind you of the goodness of God, the psalms and hymns and all these things. When you're singing them, you have gratitude in your heart. When you sing, you have gratitude in your heart. And so, praise God. Uh, learn how to change that channel. Remember I said that earlier, you change the channel and instead of sitting there going over what somebody did to you, you remind yourself of the goodness of God. And uh, we're going to see here, was Jesus, uh, was he tough? Well, we're going to see it here in the last slide here. Jesus was very tough. He's hanging on the cross. He's dying there for your sins and for mine. But he was resilient and firm and strong. And matter of fact, while he's hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. We need to take, have this same mindset Give this same kind of love to those around us and we will have true agape love. Well, God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.